You're listening to South of City Radio 94.4 FM with myself, Jimmy Petruzzi, on the Friday Sports Show. And this evening we have two really fascinating guests for you. We bring all the latest news around the area and around the world. And today we've got a really, really good balance, a really good balance of guests, um, a, a local guest. But we've also got someone from a long, long way away from uh, Salford. But it's really fascinating because we hear different perspectives from different people around the world, local and around the world. And the aim of the show is to inspire a generation to participate in sports, but also not just about playing professionally, also about getting involved in sport, whatever level that is, and, and, and being and partaking. We know all the benefits of sport, what it brings, and in the great community that we have in Salford as well. It's a fantastic community, uh, a buzzing community in and around the area. We are inundated with fantastic sporting infrastructure and sporting clubs in the area and the pathway is there to go as far as you possibly can but also getting involved is key i'm going to perspective this evening on a parent or being a parent with children who play sport at a high level and and across different levels as well so our first guest uh rachel earring she um, is <laughs> to use the the phrase the soccer mom. She's got the insight on what it's like to be uh, a parent uh, with with you know boys or you, you might have girls that play football or other sports as well. But we we don't often sort of see uh, what goes on behind the scenes. And I think that you know it's easier it's easier for us to take it for granted in one sense that you know basically the the athletes turn up and they compete but there's a lot a lot of background work that goes behind the scenes um particularly with the parents or carers as well going to insight into that as well um, but also rachel um has got experience of working in various areas um she's worked in the media and also works in the area of mental health it's going to give us an idea of what she's doing as well in that area too so rachel welcome to the show great to have you on the uh, salford uh, city radio sports show hi jimmy thanks for having me on so i use the phrase uh, Rachel, the, the 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 soccer mom, so to speak. So you have to excuse my <laughs> use of terminology um, in that sense. But can you tell us a bit about yourself and, and your involvement in football? I I, I know um, you've been involved in in the game uh, for a long time in the sense that you've got you know uh, boys that play the game. But tell us a bit of an insight in terms of um, what it's been like for you. Well, uh, first of all, I think I call myself a reluctant soccer mum because uh, football is not my passion, uh, but it is obviously my boy's passion. And having sort of three boys from the age of six down to there were six, four and and two, um, they started when they were all three or four, just because when you've got boys, you've just got to get them out of the house. Mm -hmm. You've got to run them off, let them energy be run off in any way possible. So that's how they sort of got into football. And that progressed then to them all going on to separate teams. So we had three lots of football in the house because they're all different ages. Um, The dad and I had split up. So the logistics of actually getting them from one place to another became even even more difficult. But the beauty of it is is that we, we saw that the boys were passionate about it and we pulled together and the whole family sort of pulled together to get the boys where they needed to be at specific times. And... We did that in the clubs as well, you know, so mums and dads would help each other out to sort of help the, help the kids move on and enjoy and run off their energy, and, and it brought us all closer together as well. Yeah, that's fantastic, and, you know, I, I, I admire your honesty, you know, saying that obviously, you know, football isn't necessarily your thing, so to speak, in, in relation to that, but obviously, you know, the, 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 your, your lads, they love the game, and, and you do the best you can um, as a parent to support them in, in the best way you possibly can. Um, in terms of your own perspective, from a club perspective, I think that for me, in one sense, I would say um, it's probably uh, it's probably better in one sense. It has the advantages, I should say, if you're not directly involved in, in the game in that sense because I think sometimes you get, in my experience, I'm sure the listeners will agree, uh, parents that want to get involved in the coaching side of things as well. I think I've seen it all, (laughs) yeah. Yeah, yeah. and that can be frustrating because obviously the parents are passionate and they mean well. The issue is as a coach, if they've got too much information going into their mind, it's it's generally not going to work well. I'm all for like parents coming up and speaking in the appropriate time and saying, well, um, this, that and the other. 
but equally if they're shouting from the sidelines and getting involved it makes it difficult for the the young people anyway i think in in my opinion to sort of stay focused and there's so much information coming on from very i si- could yeah. not agree more having yeah. i mean i'm 16 years down the line now having you know spent all this time doing football three times a week so i think i've seen and heard sort of everything from and the boys haven't necessarily just played with the same club we have moved them around so that they're getting the best that we could possibly give them um and yeah that passion that it's it's dads usually are obviously who Mm. actually end up coaching the boys and the passion that they have is basically what drives that that club and that group forward to to the next level but um it it can overspill and it does get passionate with parents on the sidelines and i think i noticed a difference when my elder son then moved into sort of professional side of football um and ended up at bolton from the age of 10 um, until quite recently and obviously it's very different there because um, the parents are not encouraged to be shouting from the sidelines mm. um, and the coaches coach at half time or as it was then uh, in the quarter breaks so that they have shorter halves and they'd actually have time to actually give that information to to the kids uh, in a format they could understand and then just let them play football mm. when they're on the pitch. That's a great point. I think that's, there's, there's a lot to be said for letting the the, uh, the players enjoy the game. That's the most important thing. But obviously from the professional football club point of view, you sort of uh, mentioned a professional football point of view. The, the goal is to produce professional players. And, and you know, as much as I... I think, um, well, I, I think personally it's really important that they look after the wealth of the players and that should come first and foremost And because the chances of becoming a pro footballer uh, are, are very slim. So very slim, that, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so the idea is to, to produce the best possible person you can um, educationally and, and, and obviously development-wise and just let them enjoy the experience. But all that's said and done, it is what it is. You know, I think that um, I'm certainly not naive uh, to think that you know the clubs do want to produce players and, and they spend a lot of time. They and do, effort. and the the effort and the time that they put into the boys is absolutely um, fabulous. And I think the biggest thing that we've got out of this is actually the the focus, the dedication, the actual. Um, you know, he's had to have his kit ready. He's had to get himself sorted. The discipline that it's given him as a young man, sort of growing up. Um, because a lot of people are actually quite negative about him going into that type of environment. So, oh, well, it, you know, if they get dropped, they get dropped yeah. and they're just left. Then what do they do? Mm. And um, I couldn't quite see it from that perspective because I could just see the positives of actually a child being able to follow their passion. Mm. And if you follow your passion, you you want to do well. Mm. You know, y- y- the values that you have from that, you, you're not just playing football, you're watching what is going on um, with the physios, you're watching how people interact together, you're watching what the other players do, you're seeing how the interaction is, mm. you know, from, from, from mates who are being dropped. Yeah. And what that, the implications mental health-wise, that act, what that actually means is a real knock-on effect down the line and it builds resilience and it builds discipline and it gets them really focused as, as to whether is this my passion is this something I really want to mm. pursue because it's a very tough um, environment to be in if it's not yeah that's a great point you've made there um, and the reason being it's a great point is because I, I, I sense the same where people sort of sometimes you know talk the environment down and, and, and they're afraid of losing and but then that's life, isn't it? I mean, you could do a degree at university and there's no guarantee you got a job. And, Absolutely. You know, you know having worked yeah. in the media for years, yes. you know, the, it used to be an environment where it was a pretty safe-ish environment, but mm. things change over the yeah. years. And, and contracts, work environment is changing. And, mm. you know, when you're in the media, if you're lucky, you get a three-month, six-month contract for working on a, a program, etc. cetera, then, mm. then you're blessed. But then what happens? Because you're working full out, very much like professionals in, uh, uh, in sport, in dance, uh, in acting, in whatever profession yeah. that is, you've got a really tight, passionate time scale to get that project together. Mm-hmm. And you're working all the hours God sends to, to get that done. How do you find the time to then be looking for another work? For, for that next project. No, that's a great Whereas point. with football, at least you're getting a 12 month or uh, you know two year contract out of it so that you can actually mm. flourish in that time. Yeah, no, it's really. Uh, important point i think that you know if nothing else at least you you give it a shot and you can look back in life and say well i, I gave it my best shot and sometimes you got to hold your hands up maybe 
it wasn't meant to be maybe I wasn't good enough or, or maybe um, it wasn't the timing so you know you keep going for me it's about finding your level in the game but yeah. equally you know if things are done properly you've got an educational program you've got an education at the end of it you can you can still pursue another career path you're still young enough it's not like you know you're exactly you know yeah. you're, you're, you're a million year old and, and people start again at all all ages it's you know people sort of you know start different career paths at, 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 at any age but you know, equally at 18, 19 years of age, you've got your life ahead of you if you, if you don't get in. And But, I mean, the point being is that two things I want to draw attention to there is yourself as, as, a, as a parent. Now, you know, you, you're very knowledgeable in, in the way the mind works and behavior and, and, and obviously we're going to sort of touch on what you're doing at the moment too around that area. But from the perspective of... Um, your 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 lads who play football and and you know particularly the the, the lad who's been the professional club um i think what's really important is they've got someone like yourself who understands behavior so you can mm -hmm. speak to them on you know, obviously you speak to them on a level of, as, as parent um in, in, in many respects <laughs> that's very different yeah. to yeah. actually sometimes be you know doing the, the work that i do outside yeah. of that because we all know that sometimes yeah. you know when it's your parent that's that's going on at yeah. you, especially your mum yeah, absolutely. Especially your mum. And this, I think this is a really important point mm. because, you know, us mums, we, we do such a lot. You know, we feed, we clothe, we wash, mm. we cook, we, we iron, we do all of that yeah. amongst all the mental health support yes. that we give our yeah. family in general. And we and we go to work yeah. on top of all that. I mean, I, I'd like to see more people like yourself, um, Rachel, in posterior roles in the game. And, and the reason being is that you can't put a price on the education you've learned, you know, in, in 16 years or so, seeing the lads and the trials, the tribulations, mm. and, and particularly in the, in the professional end of the game, because obviously, you know, we, the, 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 the on-off field, the, well, the off-field yeah. saga, and I don't want to, I'm not going to sort of go into that because I don't know a great deal about that, but obviously it's well documented at, at Bolton what's been going on. That's no reflection of the, the staff. They've tremendous job, and I, I do know some of the staff there, and I think sometimes when I hear... Uh, what's been said in the media about the club I kind of you know and I've had many many discussions about it I mean my daughter's a, a big Bolton fan and there's a lot of YouTubing there and we've had many discussions around the area and I kind of feel for the players and, and the staff in one sense because they have given so much and oh absolutely I think the time and the dedication that they give to you know all all the players and all the staff you know that are there is is you know the passionate is something they're very passionate mm. about and that comes across to to all everyone who's involved in it really um mm. and it, there is like you say there is a much bigger picture to all this that people don't really see you, you see the 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 actual players the first team players and y you know that's what the focus is but clubs that size there is there's so much more to it and it, it's been there for for decades and decades for people to um you know relate to uh, for example my youngest son now is benefiting from someone who played you know up until being 23 with Bolton yeah and he's now coaching my my youngest son and has been doing the coaching for the past wow. seven or eight years so those boys are getting all the benefit of his his profession back then with the same discipline the same values yeah. the same focus the same professionalism and that's taken them to win not only the um the bolton league um twice but also the lancashire mm. uh, cup twice uh, yeah. and now that they're actually you know that, that that whole team now is actually going together as as one unit um um forward to a development club which mm. is yeah, I no. don't think it's ever been, you know, I don't know that it's ever been done before, but it's 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 fabulous. Yeah, no, absolutely, and you know, I I, I you know, I hope um, that sort of Bolton, you know, things work out there, the, the, the club itself, and and you know, so I know what it means to the fans, and you know, I know what you know football clubs in general mean to the fans. So I think that you know, but these are things beyond you know uh, many people's control, and and you'd like to think that you know things uh, are run uh, in a way that sort of you know puts the club. Um, interest um, but you know it's not an area I understand too much about but mm. certainly from the training point of view and the staff point of view the staff I do know and the players I do know who've been involved in the club they've given a hundred percent and can, yeah. can you do so yeah. so you know um, you know very much so but what's interesting in, in terms of yourself and would you consider like a pastoral role for players 
uh, right? Is that something that you've ever like, thought about? Like you know, players maybe approaching someone who's sort of who's, who's got you know one foot in both camp, really. One, you're a parent of the experience, and you couldn't learn that any. I don't think any university because <laughs> how do you <laughs> teach that? How, well, yeah. How, how do you teach those experiences? But equally, you've got the knowledge too of of you know the the learnings to take away that sort of holistic outlook in and life. Is that something you ever sort of considered doing? Uh, uh, I, I've not to be to be fair, yeah. um, because um, sort of sixteen years down the line of, of sort of being involved in in football with my own boys, <laughs> it's like you know you get to a summer break and you yeah. think, oh, thank God for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but. I, you know, I, I've grown to love the game. I yeah. have grown to be very passionate about what my boys do, especially. And you know, obviously, it's them that I follow, not a specific club. Yes, um, of course, because yeah. that's where my passion lies. Um, but having seen um, how life in general does affect your performance, whether that is on or off the pitch, anything emotional that is going to affect you, if you are, if you don't deal with it, and you, you're unable to deal with it, no matter what is going on professionally in your life, you know, you get sticking blocks, and you mm. can't get past that mountain um, without actually dealing with it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And absolutely. I've managed to do that with my youngest son, who, who is more open to the tools that I have on offer, and he's now open to coming to me and saying, look, you know, I want to score more goals. I want to mm. do this. I know I've got a blockage somewhere. Let's work on this. And he's now much more open to, to sort of that approach. Yes. Um, so it, it really does work. And Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, I, I, I think, you know, the fact that you, you sort of have experienced yourself, you know, um, on the front line, so to speak, you've mm. been there, you've seen the trials and tribulations and that sort of stuff, and you can sort of make these associations in terms of the best way to move forward. I suppose in saying that there is that, um, we talked about earlier where when it's your own uh, child, there's that identity where they sort of see as mom or dad, and, and that sort of there's, there's, there's a different sort of boundary there than, say, if you go and see someone uh, professionally. But in, in one sense, it's probably more of a challenge, I think, to be able to, to do that but you know um you, there's obviously you know you, you you sort of it sounds to me race you, you've sort of taken the skills you've learned outside the game and brought them into the game but also you've taken the skills from from watching the lads play and sort of transfer them to your own uh, learnings too um in, yeah. oh gosh well kids are your biggest learning curve in life yeah. i think full stop really aren't they especially yeah. your own um so yeah i mean i i started on my sort of you know journey of of, of, of retraining myself for my kids wow purely for my kids because you know w when you end up in a situation that you don't want whether that be you know a, a divorce in a yeah. house but things like that you can't you don't always have the tools to cope on your own yes and you know when you've got three boys you, you look at every opportunity to to help yourself and them as much as possible so obviously that learning curve took me on on quite a journey and uh, perhaps i didn't get the tools as quickly as i wanted to because mm. by the time they're then teenagers they they don't really want mum's help they're quite the yeah, same yeah exactly yeah yeah so you know they've got every answer they, you know yeah. uh, and they don't always want to listen but, but that is happening yeah. that is happening more and more now um but Bis, you know, on top of that, I'm also now being able to help other young people. So the the joy is now that I'm working with families, and that is is coming forward in outside outside of my family unit. They're watching that, they're seeing that, they're seeing the results from that, and that does have a knock on effect. Yeah, no, that's interesting stuff, and uh, our listeners are probably intrigued, wondering, um, you know, what you do in in a bit more depth, and you know, you've written a book recently as well. Um, so you care to share. Uh, a bit about the book you've written and, and I know you're doing an event as well um, which I'm going to get involved in myself in, in are, yeah. I'm really excited <laughs> about doing so um, as well but can you tell us a bit about the, the book and, and the event that you're going to be um, organising um Yeah sure sure um, well the book came about with the work really that I, I was doing with the families um, because obviously a lot of a lot of guys and a lot of teenagers mm. don't want to talk about emotions never mind admit that they have any mm. um, so <laughs> I put the three charts together to actually help them um, physically see on paper you know how our emotions stick in in our sensory system because wow. it's very much if you know imagine a game of football and things aren't going well for you and you're feeling pretty bad anyway and then you've got your coach shouting at you you've got the parents shouting at you you've got your team shouting at you that sensory yeah. information gets locked into your system um, 
you know, pretty quickly in, in seconds. And the logic that goes with that might kick in, you know, two or three minutes later when everything else is caught up. So the book is really um, how that actually works with your senses, how we um, use colour, everything that we see, hear, touch, smell, okay, gets locked into our system and your whole body works like a uh, protection mode. So it, it's constantly protecting us against viruses that we might pick up in our environment. There are antibodies that kick in chemically all the time. It's the same for your emotions. If you have an emotion as a child or, or whenever and your sensory system doesn't like the effect that's having on your body, okay, it will give you uh, an, a vaccine, Okay, and it'll give you a vaccine to protect you. And every time that emotion comes back up to the surface, it'll kick in those vaccines to protect you from having that again. Mm -hmm. So the book basically just gives you five steps of awareness. So it's uh, sort of awakening to what is actually happening in your body, uh, how to engage to actually do something about it. Transform then is the next stage so that you can actually transform and take stock and take part in actually listening and, and making sure those changes happen to move you forward how you then inspire others to do the same because once you're on the journey and you see the results my goodness you really want to help others do the same and then this next stage is how do you keep sustaining yourself on that so the five steps really all just work in a cycle together because you're constantly having to waken up to okay I'm stuck again how do I need to get out of this you know I've gone that back down in the dumps how do I get myself up and there are tools that are in the book to actually help you start that process but then there are so many other modalities as, as we call them um that people can delve into that's what this event is for um, in November so that people can have a full day of coming in and experiencing you know different modalities of how this energy work can help you because it is very much a natural um, part of who you are we don't need um, a lot of chemicals put in our body to actually help us heal a lot of it can be done ourselves we can kickstart it ourselves we just need showing and encouraging and helping mm. each other along the way. So that's what the event's got. It's going to be really exciting. Yeah. It's a workshop day. You're going to be involved, which yeah, is absolutely. even more exciting. Yeah. And people are going to get to have a go. Um, of, of, it's like dating for therapy, I suppose. So it's speed dating for therapy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's going to be, and, and most of all, it's going to be fun. Because I think people think that dealing with your emotions, it's really hard work. Mm. And it's, you know, oh, it's such an effort. Uh, but you know what? Once it's done on a sensory level, it's actually really, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's no, fun. It, it's exciting. And, it, you know, we can have a real giggle. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, there, there's evidence in the literature that suggests that suppressing our emotions is not a good thing. And, and certainly, you know, talking about them um, and talking about how we feel is, 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 you know, a good good place to start. And you know, absolutely, I think that, and it's really interesting that you say because, I think particularly with with um, athletes and and you know anyone any walk of life, but you know certainly um, you know uh, with athletes and and people in football and and sometimes this this perception, Rachel outside that you know um, you know why is he that way or why is she not mm. really like, but, you know people are, are people first and foremost yeah and irrespective of you know whether they're playing for a top Premier League club making you know two hundred thousand pound a week. Um, they still feel and go for adversity. Oh gosh, yeah. All that said and done, you know, I think that sometimes, you know, um, it's good, good to get a balanced perspective. Then that's sort of even all that said and done. It's only like you know, point one percent, if even less, of footballers. And you know, up and down the country, there's plenty of footballers like you know your lads and, and that sort of stuff who sort of you know put their heart and soul in the game. And you know, I think the perception sometimes amongst fans is that you know they see the premier league and they, mm. don't, they don't realize outside the premier league and you know I, I, certainly by all accounts from what i heard um in from various sources uh, that certain players weren't paid for long periods of time and yeah and, and and people don't see that and, and people have got mortgages to pay they've got families they got you know yeah uh, and so that's not easy too and, and i think it's really important to get a balanced perspective uh for people to realize that you know You've got to love the game, but also that brings pressure. It yeah. brings an awful lot of yeah. pressure, and I, I think the one thing that I've realised is is watching watching my bro boys grow up. Obviously, there's you know, you know, one of them's gone on to do um, professional football. Yeah, but they're all good footballers. 
Mm. Uh, you know, and they all want to play professional football. Yeah. So you know, there's 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 a bit of been a bit of tension over the years <laughs> because of that, <laughs> as you can imagine, um, and. That has, in itself has brought an expectation for for you know my eldest to to perform. Yeah. Not yeah. just for the club, but for actually for his family. Yeah. You know because his brothers put pressure on him, and and for his friends, yeah. because people are so passionate about sport, especially football, because of the the media coverage that it gets. The passion that goes with this game cannot be underestimated at any level, whether that's grassroots level or premiership football level. The passion that goes with this game hits nearly every family that I know. And, you know, the, the, to be targeted every time for a conversation, how, how are you doing, how are you getting on? Because they are so passionate about that game, there's an expectation for that person to perform all the time on and off the pitch. There's no let up. Mm. And that's that's actually a huge responsibility, especially for a young young person who is just sort Absolutely. of coming out and they're watching all the mates go out and, you know, mm. have a drink and, and party and they're not included, not necessarily included, but they don't want to go out and participate because they've got a commitment to what they want to do. Mm-hmm. That's a great point. And, you know, certainly um, for our listeners, do uh, drop us a, a, an email or a comment on the Facebook page of Friday Sports Show uh, and let us know your thoughts if you are a parent in football or alternatively if you're a volunteer or anyone involved in sport on any level any feedback or any comments you'd like to uh, make on, on the show and, and you know what Rachel's talked about you know make some really really important points and also I think for me too one thing I, I, I'd sort of like to do too um, you know and before we sort of go to our next guest and, and you're welcome to hang around mm. um, is that for me one of the things that sort of gets me sometimes is that you know, I'm, I'm perfectly aware fans are entitled to their opinion and they come along and I've mm. been in the game myself for a long time, as, as you know, and as the listeners probably know. Um, but the thing that sort of gets pains me sometimes is that there's a sort of fine line between banter and, and you know, vented frustration. Oh, and absolutely. I, I think sometimes, you know, comments go under the belt. And, yeah. And, and I think for me, as, as a coach, um, you know, I sort of have sat there at times thinking, wow, you know, um, this is someone's son or daughter or you know and and absolutely and and and, you know i think this for me was highlighted when um one of my sons became a a referee at at 14 and he went he went down that path and you know he did all the training and 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 but i wasn't prepared because you Mm. don't actually you're not actually aware of it as much when you're actually a parent on the sideline until your son's in the middle of that pitch Mm. and then when your son is in the middle of the pack that pitch as a referee where he doesn't know anybody he's not supporting either side he's just on his own you know sorting out a a football match and the abuse that that person Mm. gets in the middle of that pitch from from a very young age Mm. is incredible it is because people are just projecting like you said their frustration and they're not actually seeing what's actually in front of them yeah because if it was their son in Absolutely, front yeah. of them, you know, no amount of money, okay, on yeah. any football pitch or in any any genre whatsoever, actually makes those emotions and that projection of of hate, that projection of um, you know anger at anybody mm. is worth it. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's really not absolutely. because everybody has emotions. Absolutely. No, no I mean, amount of money can co- compensate for that. Yeah. No, I, I think so. And I think for me, you know, uh, I think e- 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 even um, this doesn't make it right or, or any better, but sometimes when you hear it coming from the from, from the home fans too, and, you know, for example, they, they, their own um, team player as well, if they're having a bad game. And I, I don't think sometimes they realize how... Um, I mean, the players, to be fair, they're very professional and they, 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 they do train for that and they have got strong minds, a lot of them, but equally, all that said and done, they are human beings too. And I think yeah. for me, just sort of taking that time for me um, from a fan perspective to say, well, um, how would I feel if, if someone said that to my uh, child? And that might make them think, you know, I mean, mm. I, I'm all for the banter. 
uh, Rachel. I'm not naive. In, you know, I, I'm well aware sometimes, you know, t- heat of the moment. Oh, you know, we've, we've all done it. You know, Absolutely. gosh, mum's, mum's more, prob- more than anyone because yeah. we're, we're so protective, yeah. aren't yes. we? You know, on that pitch. But, you know, we're, we've all done it. But let's do it with an awareness. Yeah, exactly, and with some dignity as well and yeah, respect for the know, person. Yeah, with some awareness and some dignity, like you say, yeah, and that's all it needs. Absolutely, I, I agree entirely. So we're going to sort of, um, you know, Rachel's been very kind to come on board the show. Um, I was just going to say, Rachel, if you, you, you're more than welcome to, have you got any sort of um, details that we can share, like a Facebook page or something along them lines for the listeners if they want to sort of see what you do more of? You've got like a... A business yeah. Facebook page. Yeah, um, I've got, uh, it's called Live for Energy. So it's L-I-V-E number four energy, which is uh, on Facebook. Uh, and that's on Instagram at, uh, it's Live for Energy Cafe on it, Instagram and Twitter. Um, I have a Facebook group called The Spiral of Life, which is also the name of my book. Um, and the principles of everything that we do in that Facebook group is basically all the principles of everything in the book. So you actually get to show, see how you can awaken we help you do that we show you how to engage in different modalities and and what they all are transform inspire and sustain so we're we're, we're going through all that at the moment so yeah come and join us it's good fun absolutely now it's been great having on the show it's been very fascinating i'm sure the listeners really uh, enjoyed that it's something that we sort of um i don't think it's touched on regularly enough uh, in in the media you know real life experiences and and you know getting you know people um in in the show uh on on different levels not just participants but obviously you know people who participate in different ways as parents as siblings as uh, as as coaches as well so our next guest is going to be a really fascinating guest they they come from a long way away Uh, we're going to transfer codes now we're going to go into rugby um so our next guest is working at national level is a head coach of a national team i'm going to introduce him shortly um, we're going to sort of change codes across the rugby, and we've got the Rugby World Cup coming up soon. So, uh, very shortly, I'm going to introduce our next guest, and we're going to be talking all things rugby. So, we have the Rugby World Cup coming up this year, and we see a lot of the traditional sides, the you know the the, the favourites for the World Cup, uh, the likes of New Zealand, uh, England, Australia, South Africa. We see. Uh, the emerging nations coming through too as well and that's not to not to mention the likes of Wales, Ireland and Scotland have got a chance too. Uh, our next guest is a head coach of a national team, um, it's, it's Bermuda and he's had a lot of experience, he's, worked, he's working I believe in the men's game now as well as the women's game too and he's also worked in Malaysia and the UK. So Jamie, welcome to the show, great to have you on board. Thank you Jamie, lovely to chat. Yeah, that's no, fantastic to have you on board. And as I've mentioned, we sort of, and we think rugby, we think, you know, some of the more traditional uh, rugby nations, but yourself, can you tell us about the experience, the, the Bermuda experience for yourself? How did that sort of begin and how did, how did you find yourself in the position you're in uh, coaching Bermuda? Um, yeah, yeah, no, sure. Um, well, I mean, um, Bermuda is, is as, as, a, as a nation, we sit within the Rugby America's North. Uh, quadrant, so that means we play uh, a lot against we play against a lot of the Caribbean nations. But um, my experience is, so I've actually moved to the island within the past year. Um, my wife was actually given a she was um, she was lucky enough to get a job here in in on the island at mm-hmm. um, a school called Bermuda High School for Girls, and then um, I've just completed a master's. So um, we travelled out here together in Bermuda and. Um, Bermuda uh, is a is a small island, so once you get kind of chatting with a few people, it's not long before uh, people figure, oh, well, this this guy used to be involved doing coaching some rugby somewhere. Let's see if we can get him involved. And I guess that's really how um, I got involved in Bermuda rugby initially was just through some conversations with a few people. Wow! And uh, one thing led to another, and <laughs> I was asked. Uh, I was asked to take on the national team, which is uh, which was a real privilege. So that's fantastic. That's my story. Yeah, no, that's really interesting stuff. And and I believe prior to Bermuda, you had an experience working in Malaysia. Was that the sort of um, case where you were working in in Malaysia as well? That's right. Yeah. So um, I was I was fortunate enough to be. Um, I was actually my full time role out there was um, as an athletics director in a um, in a in actually in a in a large international school and. Uh, 
but at the same time, I was able to, uh, I was given the opportunity to coach a team called Cobra uh, Rugby Club, which are um, in the Malaysian Super League. And I mean, rugby in Malaysia is, is really exploding. They've got some wonderful talent, and um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of infrastructure in the game around Malaysia. So um, yeah, they're a little bit of a, a sleeping giant, I feel. But um, yeah, I was very lucky to be involved with them as well. So um, yeah, that's really yeah, interesting stuff. A, a, yeah, yes. no, it's fascinating stuff. And in terms of um, Bermuda, I, I, I believe recently uh, that you went over to the um, uh, Olympic qualifiers. And I mean, how does that work? Um, how do you guys get on in that uh, in that tournament? Yeah, so so that was the um, so we basically we basically we took over the men's uh, a men's and women's uh, team to compete um, for what is an Olympic qualifying event for Rugby America's North area. Um, the the women ended... Oh, excuse me. I've got a dog barking in the yeah. <laughs> That's difficult for me. Yeah, yeah, Animals yeah. Animals just appear out of anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, no, the, the women's team ended up... Um, they ended up finished up six, and they put in a really good performance um, throughout the two days. Yeah. And then the uh, the men's team actually qualified themselves for what is known as the repechage game, which is basically um, uh, it's, it's basically a game which qualifies you for a another. It's a third place playoff, which then qualifies you for another Olymp- uh, Olympic event um, mm. where where a team can still qualify. Um, yeah. But unfortunately, Bermuda went down in that game to Mexico. We were a very well drilled side. Wow! And, um, but it was, it was a really good experience, I think, for both the men and the women. So, and so we did, we did pretty well. Yeah, I mean, realistically, how far can Bermuda go? I mean, I, I don't like to use the word realistic because we know that you know in sport, uh, many things are possible. But but realistically, in terms of pathway to to a World Cup, is there is there an opportunity? Um, for I mean uh, to be fair the United States has got and Canada uh, decent rugby teams at the moment obviously Bermuda doesn't have the same size population but is there is there a realistic chance maybe one day we might see Bermuda in the World Cup do you know what? I always think that it's important to have what I call uh, big hairy audacious goals <laughs> yeah. um, and why not you know I think um, if anything in my time I'm involved in as a teacher and, and, and coaching sport has taught me that never underestimate what the power of a few people can do so the the, the positive optimistic side of me will always err on the side of things because I think why not that's what sport's about it's about dreaming big um, uh, but on the pragmatic side of things there's always a series of behind any successful sport team there will tend to be some form of infrastructure there um, and or whether it's culturally ingrained, and I mean, you touched on it. You mentioned just there, Jimmy, that yeah. Bermuda's not a huge population, which is isn't it? sixty thousand. Mm. Um, but the game is certainly growing within Bermuda. There's a there's um, there's a couple of guys, um, a chap called Paddy Caller, who's actually the uh, he's the development rugby officer. He's the development officer on the island. He's the one paid uh, member of staff, which actually has grown the students' game. Um, so. At the high school level, it's now being seen in schools. Uh, rugby's now being played in schools. Mm-hmm. And the women's side of the game has gone and grown considerably over the past uh, six months. So there's a lot of really good things happening off the field. Um, mm-hmm. Led by the president here, a chap called Sean Montfield. Um, and so let's hope that one day, if they keep going in the right direction, there's some wonderful talent on the island. There's... Uh, Bermudans are, are extremely athletic, like um, like most Caribbean islands. Mm-hmm. Um, great sprinters, uh, very powerful, uh, very powerful athletes. So um, yeah, I think with a little bit of expertise here and there, yeah, sure, I think they can, they could, uh, they could surprise a few people someday for sure. Yeah, I mean, you never know. I mean, it's one of them really too, Jamie. Where you know, sometimes it's like you know, uh, in this day and age, you've got players who. Um, you know, for example, not that I'm advocating for it, but obviously people make their own decisions. But you know, we see certain players, certainly in in, in rugby and, and many other sports, where they might have been born somewhere else, but they qualify to play for another 
national team for one reason or the other, be it parents, grandparents, or they might have lived there for a certain number of years. So, I mean, do you guys look out for potential players who could play for Bermuda? Is that something that you sort of actively do? Maybe look, say, uh, in America, Canada, there's anyone out there that could qualify for you guys? or? Yeah, no, that's right. So the, so the selection policy kind of for the national team is, is really that there, in some ways there is no policy so similar mm. to like a, a Scotland who's a much higher tier nation you know they will they will look to drag players in from anywhere around the globe absolutely um, th- there are there are some slight st- there is th- Bermuda's very unique in its um, in its citizenship laws so whilst there are whilst world rugby requires you to have residency within a country for three years uh, and some, and then formally some kind of some link through uh, through parents or grandparents and um, there is a unique nature about Bermuda which is um, it is becoming a citizen is 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 uh, is not quite as straightforward as living in the country um, oh, okay. over a period of time um, yeah 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 so so that, that makes it a little bit challenging mm, mm. Um, but other than that, we've got there's a lot of Bermudan players who are applying their trade outside of Bermuda itself, and um, yeah, we we keep tabs of everybody, and we look to get them, we bring them into the national team squad as and when is appropriate and when fits in with their life as well, mm. you know, um, and and with their clubs tonight. So yeah, we're very fortunate to have quite a large squad at the moment. We have over we have over 55 players which are involved in elite player development group. And that number fluctuates. So sometimes we have more, sometimes we have less. But what it means is we just get all our noses pointing in the same direction. Mm. Um, so yeah, yeah so it's very unique and big, but we do cast the net wide for sure. Yeah. To give us a sense of perspective, Jamie, on the level of the national team, you know, obviously you mentioned there the population of Bermuda is 60,000, but to give us a sense of perspective of the national team and the level they're at, how would you sort of compare them to, I mean, let's say, uh, what are some of the games that you've been involved in um, uh, with other nations? So, um, how would you sort of compare the, the level uh, from a national point of view? Sure. Yeah. So, um, so I came on board in January, and um, I mean, it's, it's, since January, we played three games. We often um, we've we've played a couple of warm up games against different universities. So we played against Princeton University, who okay. are. Uh, to our Harvard University out of US, and yes. that was a, that was more of a that was a good warm up game for the team. But um, I'd expect that our team would be scoring, you know, uh, fifty points or so. So they, they, but the the one that we've made that's been the most interesting, I think, which has put us to see where we are at the moment. We played Jamaica uh, not so long ago, and Jamaica were actually ranked uh, 40, 42nd, I think it was the fifteen team in the in the Rugby America's North area, mm-hmm. and we were ranked down in seventieth. We've had a, we've had a bit of a bad run for two years, but um, there's certainly an upward trajectory at the moment. And um, we ended up on the right side of the scoreboard that day, scoring seven tries, and the, the, the score was forty three fourteen. So that really catapulted Bermuda up and uh, towards the top top forty in, in that in their area. And um, they've now qualified for the Caribbean Championship final, which is on September the 21st, which is against Guadeloupe. Wow. So, yeah, so the team are, there's, there's, a, there's a very strong batch of players here. Um, it's a real mix of, of some, I would say, of expat players, so players that have often probably learned a lot of, played a lot of rugby, you know, learned rugby um, probably in the western side of the world. And... And then you've got a lot of younger Bermuda mm. talent, is what I, is how I would put it. So, guys who have kind of in the past ten years or so have been learning how to play rugby here in Bermuda, and um, yeah. wonderful, wonderful players. So, I think that mix is you know works really well. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's yeah. really interesting stuff. And I think, I mean, by the sounds of things anyway, it sounds like you're sort of, you know, punching above, um, you know, you're weighed in the sense that obviously for a population of 60,000 and, and um, I'm sure there's other sports too that you've got that uh, compete 
for players too. Um, like you said, that you know, from a, a naturally athletic point of view. What are the other sports that you've got out there too, uh, Jamie? Is it? I mean, I'm, I'm, is, is is football popular out there? I mean, you know, football is obviously a global sport. You know, is cricket popular out there too? Is it just generally, um, you know, a few sports? Yeah, no, fo- football and cricket are, uh, being a Caribbean nation, yeah. are uh, are amongst the two most popular sports. I mean, the football has had some wonderful success recently. They qualified for the first, for the first time in Bermudan history, they qualified for the Gold Cup. Yeah. And um, they got their first ever win in the Gold Cup as well. So, um, led by a, by a former, uh, by a former, um, we uh, probably played in the Premiership with a chap called Kyle Lightbourne, yeah. um, so a former professional who's, who's, who's played his trade through a number of clubs uh, in the Premiership. But he's been there uh, and in the English leagues. But he's he's come on board over in Bermuda, and this is his second stint of coaching. And um, yeah, the team had done fabulous, but it was a real. It was all. It almost gave me a bit of if you watch the film Cool Runnings. It was yeah, yeah, yeah. Where Bermuda was kind of bouncing around when the football is all over there. So. Um, yeah, certainly something I think that all sports would want to emulate that feeling in the country and on the island. So yeah, no, yeah and then the other one's cricket. Cricket's quite big as well. Yeah, absolutely, and, and yeah, and I could imagine that you know with, with, with the population um, being um, sixty thousand or so, uh, and and obviously sport being of interest there, and you've got the likes of um, you know football, and you've got the likes of say. Uh, cricket too, which sort of present pathways to to become a professional. Like you mentioned, I'm sure you know many players aspire to maybe one one day they're playing uh, in professional leagues, be it cricket or uh, be it uh, rug, uh, sorry football. Is there the same opportunity, um, Jamie, for, for 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 rugby? Is there a pathway that they can sort of take to maybe you know go on to play abroad or, or maybe you know uh, find a team? Um, you know, maybe maybe they can get like a scholarship somewhere in, in the states, or maybe yeah. going to play abroad. That's right. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's, um, in fact, several there's several men and women who have uh, who have been involved in in securing scholarships. So we have a, we have a, a young player who's 19 by the name of Alex Doyling, who's uh, in the past mm. few years has, has secured a, a scholarship to a place called Cutstown yeah. in the US, um, and he's been so he's been busy. Um, he's been busy, really, being subjected to a, a you know a, an everyday, more professional kind of life of rugby. Because um, rugby is also taking off quite, uh, it's taken off in the US. So there's a lot more time, a lot more kind of uh, emphasis put on it, uh, especially at the university level. So we've managed to get a couple of athletes. Uh, another one of our athletes, will say why it was offered an opportunity over at uh, Humber University. Um, yeah, so we've had quite a few players. And we've got a couple of players who are. There's another chap who's actually playing over in, who's playing in the MLR as well. So yeah. that's the Major League Rugby League over in in the states. So yeah, we've got we've got quite a few connections, and um, we're also we've been working with a group called Atavus as well. Who a bunch, it's actually um, you may know a chap called uh, Wazali Serevi, who uh, mm-hmm. used to be a bit of a Fijian legend, who's yeah. been over here. It's his company, and he's work. He brings across. Some wonderfully talented coaches. So I've just spent the past week with a, with Ben Gollings, who's the um, the world record points holder um, for uh, for England sevens. Yeah. And sorry for world sevens. So, it's, yeah. it's the world record. It's not just for England. Yeah. Um, and and you know, we get we get a lot of very very experienced former players and coaches come over, and they'll come and get involved with it. But they give us more than that. They just give us good links to other places as well. So yeah. we're able to get in, you know, give some of our athletes opportunities to go and play uh, in professional leagues elsewhere or, or get scholarships. So yeah, there's 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 plenty of that going on, mm-hmm. um, and a lot of a lot of that works um, been done by uh, people like Jonathan Cassidy uh, yeah. and Tom Healy, who are involved heavily with coaching on the island in the seven sector. So yeah, there's a lot of people behind that, which is which is which which are well worth mentioning. Yeah, that's no, really interesting stuff. And you mentioned the sevens there. I mean, do you see the sevens as being a more? I wouldn't say realistic, but do you see it as being an option uh, for success because obviously you don't have the demands of the. Um, I wouldn't say the demands. It is a very demanding game. Sevens, no doubt, physically. But from the point being that you know, I would sort of 
I mean, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would see the sevens as being a bit more like, say, you know, for cricket followers, like a t, you know, a 2020 compared to a test match, um, you know, where you got more of a chance in terms of if you know, some of the some of the some of the the, the 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 nations that don't have the depth as the uh, the top tier nations. Do you see the sevens as being an opportunity um, to maybe um, assert yourselves, or is that just equally as tough as well yeah i think so i I think that um i think whenever you look at the difference between 15s and sevens fundamentally 15 requires it 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 just requires there's more players involved yeah Um, and there's more there's it's a very unique kind of skill set you know uh, that you need more Mm. skill sets that are required just because of differences in playing position um seven seems to would i it seemingly suits uh, Bermuda much better. It's mm. a much more. It's an open, expansive game. It's yeah. a game for speedsters, uh, and that sits in with our with our culture here. And um, and it's and in many ways, it's a simpler game in many ways. Yeah. Um, and 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 you know, you can get relative kind of success early doors. I think with with um, with the right kind of athletes. Um, mm. So. Yeah, I think the seven's probably well. It's, it's certainly proven to be the most successful out of the two codes uh, historically that we've got. Um, that's for sure. And um, but the fifteens are certainly kind of I would say probably I would say the sevens are the the kind of the gold standard for us at the moment. And the fifteens is a program which is certainly catching up quickly. So yeah, and absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the sort of rationale behind it, I thought maybe you know. Um, you know, for example, you know, obviously Fiji's a strong nation in the 15s too, but in the sevens, they, you know, that athleticism and just sheer creativity, um, sort of, you know, always one of the toughest teams to beat uh, in in the world. So, in the sense that you know, the the duration of the game is shorter as well, and and it's a chance for the players to excel athletically. I think uh, the other thing I was thinking I meant to ask you as well, uh, which I think would be fascinating, is that you know. You, obviously, coaches take jobs with some of the, the, the top tier nations, and you know, there's a lot of pride uh, in doing that and expectation as well. Um, let's say you know someone takes a, a job coaching the likes of a Wales, a Ireland, England, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand. There's a lot of expectation to to go out there and win something. Um, you know, with yourself, I'm sure there's expectations, but. I think there's something special about what you're doing in the sense that, you know, leaving the legacy as well and, and sort of, you know, obviously not being an established uh, nation in, in, in the sense that, you know, like a top-tier nation. Do you feel that sort of opportunity, Jamie, to leave a legacy or is, do you just sort of take it in your stride? Yeah, I think it's, I think, I think whenever, whenever, as a player or as a coach, whenever you're involved in a team, you want to write your own story, Mm -hmm. uh, which is, which is different to everybody else's and you have to find out what's unique to you. Um, And there are so many, you know, whilst being on the right side of the scoreboard is, is sometimes Mm -hmm. what it's all about. There's a whole series of other things that are, that, arguably matter more and they're actually the reasons behind probably success on the scoreboard mm. um so yeah there's always there's always an element i think of uh, I, th- I, w- I would always challenge any players and coaches to, to leave a, a, a you know a, a, a footprint of you know uh, what they've been doing or or what they've done when they finish you know on mm. any on any team or any place i think that's uh I think that's certainly something that you you get into it for, right? Um, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I think you know, you know, no, you know even uh, you know, fifty years, hundred years from now, and you know, many many years to come. It's like you know, you know, one looks back at pivotal moments in 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 every sporting establishment's uh, timeline, and we see instrumental people who have been involved who sort of move the game forward, whether that be rugby or football or. Or, or, or cricket or any sport for that matter um, which is sort of key uh, for me um, in moving forward and and into, I mean obviously you saw you involved in the women's and men's game and what's the experience been like in, in you know how do you differentiate is, do you approach the um, your coaching philosophy differently or do you sort of have the same philosophy for the women and men's game uh, Jamie is, is it a different approach or obviously just adapt your philosophy to the actual uh, different um, different teams yeah do you know um, 
philosophy actually molds itself around the team. So, yeah. so, sl- so my philosophy is uh, is slightly different in terms of what the objectives are with each team. Um, but how I go about, if you the actual coaching philosophy, how I actually go about implementing that on the on the field, pretty much stays the same. Um, so with the with the women's team, there's a there's a big emphasis, slightly different need on, you know, the, the philosophy there is much is much more surrounded by better people, better athletes. Um, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a big part because we're actually supporting um, the. We're supporting the development of, a, of, of younger females into the game of rugby. Yes. Um, so there's a little bit more of, a, of kind of a, of kind of a youth sports philosophy associated with that. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of teaching of and developing of character skills through the game of rugby with the women's side. With the men's side, slightly different. That these guys uh, are all about for them. They're all about trying to win games of rugby. And yes, it's more about how they do that. So, yes. Yeah, so in terms of the objective streets team, slightly different. In terms of coaching philosophy, in terms of you know, do I, you know, is there a athlete centered game, uh, game related environment? Yeah, they're exactly the same. So how we deliver it is is the same, but the um, yeah, the overall philosophy is slightly different. Yeah, that no, really that's yeah. really interesting insight um, in terms of how you adapt. Uh, to, to the different uh, different teams and it's been really fascinating so sort of, you know time is getting the best of us it's been a really fascinating insight uh, Jamie for our listeners no doubt um, you know we aim to promote the game the local sports but we also want to get people um, from abroad and around the world to share different perspectives and that's how we can all learn uh, off each other and you know the goal is to increase participation of sport but also you know, give that awareness of sort of what goes on um, in sport across the broad range of areas and, and no doubt at some point you know we'll, we'll hopefully interview again and, and, and track the progress of uh, Bermuda and, and no doubt you'll have a big influence in, in the actual infrastructure in the game there on various levels so I want to thank you for coming on board the show uh, Jamie it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show and, and we wish you all the very best uh, with Bermuda and um, it'd be great to have you on board again sometime too thanks Jamie yeah Thanks, Jimmy. Thanks, thanks ever so much for, for the chat and, and lovely to be considered. So there you have it, an interesting perspective from Jamie Barnwell, who's the head coach of Bermuda. And what a fascinating show it's been. We've had you know, uh, Rachel Earing, who's come on board the show. And, and as I mentioned earlier, it, you know, the, the phrase soccer mom doesn't do um, the work that you know, parents do, like Rachel, um, in, in the game, supporting uh, their children in the game and you know we we know sometimes that you know uh, a parent you know certainly a, a mum in these circumstances is, is more than a mum no doubt she plays the role of psychologist nutritionist taxi driver all these things that sometimes we sort of take for granted and parents up and down the country who do that um, I think that it's, it's really commendable um, in terms of you know increasing participation but the positive feeling in the community and for her to sort of extend her skill set uh, across a broad range of areas is, is is fantastic and 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 the likes of Jamie who's come on board the show and it sort of gives an insight in terms of what it's like to coach uh, a team that's sort of outside the spotlight of the media as well so know that you've enjoyed this evening's show and wherever you are whatever you're doing um, I wish you a fantastic weekend and, and certainly you know get down to watch the uh, Salford football or rugby club over the weekend we, we're inundated with great sporting establishments in the area until next week same time same place the Friday sports show on Salford City 94.4 FM with Jim Bertruzzi have a fantastic weekend and look forward to having you on board soon